Good morning and welcome to the Dollar Museum. My name is Craig Petersburg. I'm the education coordinator here. And this morning, I would like to talk about Dalinian science, perception, and brain research. Before I begin, I would like to go over the sources because they were wonderful and inspired this talk. The first one is Slights of Mind. And this is two PhDs who have been studying the neuroscience of illusion. Primarily, they were studying magic and, and how magic illusions work. And through that, they start to understand the way our brains interpret illusion. Secondly, uh, Daniel Pink, who has written a few books, but this one, A Whole New Mind, is talking about how right brain problem solvers will be the future, at least for the Western world. And finally, Carl Zimmer wrote an article recently in 2014 called The New Science of the Brain. And this is getting into actually photographing inside the brain what is occurring when different kinds of neural processes are occurring. And the last source is one that I really enjoyed when I was a classroom teacher from Betty Edwards. This is the new drawing on the right side of the brain. And one of the things that she discovered is just by turning an image upside down and having someone try to draw it that way, it changes from a left brain image of a horse to a right brain image of just lines and shapes. Simple, simple process and amazing results. So here we go. Do, sci do the scientists you meet always take you to be mad? Salvador said they did not. He said, I'm a blessed with a certain amount of genius. From time to time, I say something that doesn't strike them as all that impossible. Scientists did not invent the vast majority of visual illusions. Painters did. And this started over 500 years ago. And the interesting thing is they did a very scientific approach. It was just a trial and error. And then shared information, and finally groups of people were sharing information. And the perception, the illusion, started to spread from uh, the Western Hemisphere across the globe. This painting, Impression of Africa, done in 1938 by Salvador Dali, uh, hangs in my studio. And the painting on the left, Liquid Desires, Beliefs, and Memories, done in 2008, is an attempt to meld my symbols and my style of painting uh, with what I've learned about Dali and his style of painting. So the beginning of this lecture actually began in 2008, because the process of understanding this also guided me, just like the people doing the process of investigating the mysteries and magic, I was investigating the mysteries and magic of this painting by Salvador Dali. So let's discuss the brain. Scientists estimate that 84%, 84% of all the genes in our DNA become active somewhere in the adult brain. There are 100,000 miles of fibers called white matter. This can circle the earth four times. And we all have this. The typical brain consists of some 100 billion cells. And they connect and they communicate with up to 10,000 colleagues. Imagine that number. Together they forge a network, one quadrillion connections that guide what we do. Our brains are very complex. You may be thinking you're aware of all of your surroundings. But at any given time, you are actually blocking out about 95%. You're focusing on a very small amount of information and then processing that. And this one really pleased me when I read it. A decade of research says that multitasking is a myth. We really can only concentrate on one thing at a time. So if we think or, or believe we're concentrating on more than one, either they will both be diminished or one will have to supersede the other. 
Basic knowledge of the brain, of course, we all know there are left and right hemispheres, and they control different things. So we're going to run through this quickly, and I'm asking you to take a little quiz as we go. When I list these and explain them, I would like you to record how many left on your left hand, how many right on your right hand. If you can do that in your head, you have more power than I do. So here we go. Verbal. Do you use words name, describe, or define? That's left. Or do you use nonverbal cognition to process perceptions? Choose one. Number two, analytic. Figuring things out step by step and part by part. On the right, synthetic. Putting things together to form wholes. Number three, symbolic. Using a symbol to stand for something. Or actual, real, relate to things as they are at the present moment. Four, abstract, taking a small bit of information, using it to represent an entire thing. Or analogic, seeing likenesses among things, understanding metaphoric relationships. Yeah, you're keeping track. Here we go, number five. We're all halfway. Temporal, keeping track of time, sequencing one thing after another and non-temporal, without a sense of time. To give a quick example, uh, early in my career, when I had small children at home, I was working on a series, and they got ready for school, went off to school, I went and started painting in the studio. A short time later, I looked up, and one of my children was standing in my studio, and I went, did you miss the bus? What happened? What's going on? And she said, yeah, it's 3.30, I'm home after school. Obviously, I was in the non-terrible zone. Six, rational, drawing conclusions based on reason and facts. Non-rational, not requiring a basis of reason or facts, willingness to suspend judgment. We do this a lot when we watch films and, and read books, for instance. Seven, digital, using numbers as in counting or spatial, seeing where things are in relation to other things and how parts go together to form the whole. We're almost finished, keep track. Number eight, logical. Draw a conclusion based on logic, one thing following another. Or intuitive, making leaps of insight, often based on incomplete patterns, hunches, feelings, or visual images. And number nine, linear. Thinking in terms of linked ideas, one thought directly following another, or holistic, seeing whole things at once, perceiving the overall patterns and structures. So, total them up. Total them up. You have nine total. Often people are close on both sides, but it can't go one way or the other. But by just answering those nine questions, you really can understand more about how you think and how you interpret. So let's get going. Salvador Dali, 1931, Persistence of Memory, the, the melting watch piece of artwork. So of course this is one that was uh, revolutionary, made him world famous, and is a very, very simply constructed piece. A barren landscape, a small number of elements, and mysterious meanings. At the time it was made, People didn't know enough about him or understand enough about him to probably really understand the painting is the way we do now, when we've had all the luxury of time to read about it, to, to read about what he said, and also to study the piece. You have memory illusions, and they stem from your need to make sense of the world. So when we look at something like this, that's a little strange, a little unusual, we're trying to figure it out. We want to figure it out. We want to understand it. You can imagine an event and then fill in the details as needed. So we don't need all the information. We just need part of it. And your expectations are based on two things, your experiences and your memories. And they blend together. Over time, researchers have found that your memory has a, a reasonable limit of about seven units. But what you can do is you can chunk them as well. Here's an example. My memory 
seven, if I get to seven, it's amazing. I'm lucky. Um, I have six children and a dog and a wife and six grandchildren. That's more than seven. My dog even has so many names that sometimes it's hard to remember. So what I do is I've learned to chunk. I didn't know if that's what it's called, but that's what it is. So if I can remember the first letter of the first name, all the other children are hooked onto that name, and all I remember is that one big thing, and then I have room for six more. So this is the way people who are really amazed, uh, amazing with their memory, they're very good at chunking, and they have these little mental coat hangers that trigger that chunk. By the way, my dog's name is Otto Gaylord Valentino Von Petersburg Jr. Not quite seven, six, but I still have to go through it in the exact order of them, remember all the names. You have different types of memory. We all do. Procedural and declarative. The first kind is about physical skills. Walking, talking, playing sports, whatever. Declarative is a little bit different. It deals in facts and it's subdivided. So we have semantic memory, and that is coding meanings, definitions, and concepts, and then episodic. And episodic encodes experiences from your unique personal past. So episodic is very unique to each individual. So why was Dolly interested in all this? Why does this mean anything to him? Most of the research I'm talking about is very current within the last decade, after he has passed away. But he was concerned about this earlier in his career. And he said, artists scarcely interest me at all. I believe that artists should have some notions of science in order to tread a different terrain, which is that of unity. He was like a scientist, like a mathematician, who spoke through his language of art. It started very young for him. He had a schoolmaster, Signor Traitor, who had an apartment of curiosities. And this apartment housed things from stuffed animals to electronic devices to visual devices. And the, the most amazing thing that Salvador has spoken about is the optical things that he discovered there. That stayed with him his whole life. Some of his greatest works are based on optics. So here's an example of what this first optical theater would look like. And he said, these images were to stir me most deeply for the rest of my life. And they did. Here's an early slide projector lit by candlelight and given a three-dimensional view. Here's an example as late as 75, 76, where he is doing these stereo-optic paintings, where he does two images, and when they combine, they give you depth. They give you more of a three-dimensional image. He wasn't the first one to think about things like this, however. Leonardo drew a viewing device that helped record perspective through a grid. And in 1525, Durer used one as well, one of the greatest draftsmen of all time. Not to be outdone, Dali's viewing device is through a sea urchin. This was in, uh, in a book that he wrote. And then, of course, his first days of spring in 1929 was a very shocking uh, surrealist painting that is very stark, very direct, one-point perspective and houses not only painted images, but a number of collage images that are melded in so beautifully that you have to really look for it. And of course, it shows a lot of his Freudian philosophy as well. So his visual illusions occur when physical reality does not match perception. And that's a huge part of surrealism. When we see things that are unfamiliar, the first layer, the first things that we relate to are the edges and the contours. And that's something we do as a, as a child, a young child. Those we recognize early on. We get more sophisticated as we build up our experiences. At age 15, Dolly was already writing 
in a student magazine and did an article on Leonardo. This is the treatise that Leonardo, one of Leonardo's pupils actually put together and created, but it was recording what Leonardo had taught them. And this is one of the things that came out of it. If you're familiar with Dali, you know about his paranoid critical method, a way of letting his left and right brain, his conscious and subconscious flow freely to create something new and different. Well, Da Vinci said, if you look into clouds or puddles or stains on a wall, you can find images in them. And he told this to his pupils so they would become more creative and use both sides of their brain, although he had no research to verify that. He just knew it worked. Well, Dali knew about this. He even drew like da Vinci and painted like da Vinci in some of his paintings. And I found this picture on the left. I don't know who took it. And I assumed it was a Photoshop. Someone just created that. Because that horse is just too perfect. One day, driving into work, about two or three weeks ago, I'm coming towards the museum. I look up at a cloud, and I pulled over because that cloud had a similar form. It looked more like a Shetland pony than a horse, but it was there. It really was there. I wish I had taken a picture. So even though I thought that was created by someone, it could happen in nature. It's just astounding. So, Leonardo says that in and of themselves, things are meaningless. However, through visual subjective fantasy, a new invention of speculation emerges by which, if you consider them well, you will you'll find really marvelous ideas. And this triggered something in Dali. Dali was always looking for the hidden meaning, the hidden image, and then showing it to us, or hiding it with his artwork, and having us discover it just the way he did. So this was called the Paranoid Critical Activity, and it was written in The Conquest of the Irrational in 1935. Different than anyone had ever read up to that point. And then Freud, who was, according to Dali, his father for a while, adopted father, Freud said that he did an article on Leonardo and he said, it's the only beautiful thing I've ever written. That's a very interesting statement. We have discovered that the real and the imagined share a physical source in your brain. So we don't have two distinctly different things going on here. And I think that we see the subconscious and the conscious, or the left and right side, as two very, very vastly different things. Not true. Not true. The same me mechanism is used for both when we sleep and when we're awake. Here's a painting where Dali has melded a number of double images and illusions into one painting, Old Age, Adolescence, Infancy, done in 1940. Your brain is constantly comparing incoming information to what it already knows, expects, or believes. And all great art is based on a violation of this, of your ability to predict. So you see something, you see an image, you make sense of it, you bring it to a conclusion to understand it, and you end up in a place that's different than the artist has shown you. Now you need to reevaluate. You are a prediction machine. You do it effortlessly. You don't feel it happening, you don't work at it, it is the way we are. Perception is not a process of passive absorption, but of active construction. We're building this in our head. We're constructing these ideas and images, and we're good at it. Of course, we have to collect the information too. So we're collecting through our senses. They not only interact, but they enhance each other. 
So if you touch something, you feel something, looking at it, or if it makes a noise touching it, that's all part. It all processes. Sometimes in a way that you don't even know what's happening. So your senses are gathering this information. And we have neurons that are multi-sensory, not just for one, so that they blue blend and we start to have multi-layered understandings. The average bureaucrat in 1930, of course, uh, Dolly had a falling out with his father. He went to uh, the university to study for, to be an art professor, um, chose to not participate in his final dissertation and was expelled without a degree. His father was not happy and this caused a huge rift in the family. And this painting talks about that. What is interesting is, maybe it's hard to see here, but just to the left of the head are two tiny figures, an adult and a child. And now it gives you that perception. We're observing this, they are too. And it gives you more meaning. Dolly talking about his father, maybe to his father. Perception means resolving ambiguity. And in paintings like this, there's a lot of ambiguity. There's a lot to resolve. There have been a few artists that really stand out over time. M.C. Escher is one of them. The way he drew that piece on the left is that he made small gradual errors along the entire structure and you cannot concentrate and see them with the naked eye. If you focus on one small part, you might recognize that this stairway goes up, but it should go down. Or this person is upside down instead of right side up. But when you see it as a whole, your brain wants to make sense out of this. So it does. It does. And it looks normal. I look at that, it looks like a normal structure. When you dissect it, you see how he did it. It was brilliant. Just brilliant. There's a piece of M.C. Escher's that was not completed. And a team of scientists tried to complete it using computers. It took five programs to complete this morphing, this transition, because he had so much math in his head, he could simultaneously do more than one approach. It was fascinating to hear the scientists talk about it. It took a team to understand what he did naturally. So your brain is not just one thing. Your eyes tell you only part of what you're able to see. The rest is done by your brain. And this is not simple, it's a labyrinth. You have an optic nerve that leads from your eye back into your brain. And everything that's taken in through your lens and taken down your optic nerve is seen in patterns. Not necessarily what you believe you are seeing. It's transferred. Just like when we transfer waves through the air to a television set. You don't see them. But they exist. And then they're transformed back into an image. This painting, of course, is in our collection. One of the most popular pieces it incorporates so many different things about mortality, about his personal life, about his personal beliefs, and also about optics. This piece is about the pixels that were uh, discovered through Scientific American, an article that talked about pixelating a picture to a certain point and then you cannot recognize the person's face, even if they're famous or recognizable. So, Dolly took this picture of Lincoln, collaged it onto the canvas, and constructed this amazing painting around it. And then says that you need to get back 20 yards, or 20 meters, excuse me, to take it in and really see it. And it's amazing when you see people's responses when they do this. And this, this pixelated Lincoln suddenly becomes much more realistic. And it's all done because of your eyes and your brain. How he knew that is phenomenal, because some of the science has just recently been discovered. 
you fill in the parts that are missing. Your brain does. This is a fact that really, really blew me away. Each eye is equivalent to a one megapixel camera. That sounds like a lot, but your cell phone takes better pictures. Your cell phone camera is more effective than your eye. So something else is going on. What is it? Well, Salvador did another painting. He took 50 abstract pictures, arranged them in a very systematic way, and hit a, a double image in it. The image of a tiger, and the image of three Lenins masquerading as Chinese. One's from two yards, one's from six yards. So now, he's playing with our perception according to the distance we are from the canvas. I'm not going to get super technical, but this is kind of interesting. As all this information enters your brain, it goes to your primary visual cortex. And this extracts more detailed information about the visual world. It's kind of a processing center. And then you start to pick out the lines, the edges, the corners in a visual scene, whether it's a piece of artwork or you're watching television. The first layer of the visual system is contrast. So contrast is a key element in art. If you want someone to see something in your artwork and there's no contrast or very little contrast, it's going to be much more difficult. If things are high contrast, it's clear, it's quick and direct. And here's two examples. The other thing that's very interesting is this property of detecting contrast forms the basis of all cognition, including your capacity to see, hear, feel, think, and pay attention. Just think that without that, detecting contrast we can compare and contrast things. We wouldn't have knowledge. Knowledge comes from that. It's a basic, basic need that we have as human beings. Have you been paying attention? It looks like you are. I believe you are. But I'm not sure if you are. Because there's different ways of paying attention. Marty Feldman, I'm not sure about him either. He's looking at me and he's not looking at me. I wonder if he's paying attention. The different types of attention include top-down, bottom-up, overt-covert, and joint attention. The reason I'm talking about this is that without paying attention, again, we don't take in the information, we can't process it, we don't learn. So, sensory capture is when we use our senses and it flows up and we store it in our brain, we process it. But, if you want to think about something that you might already know, you're paying attention the opposite. You're taking given information and you're processing it the other way. So we can do both. Overt attention is when you are direct, you're directing your eyes and your concentration towards any one given thing. Covert is a little tricky. As a an educator, you get kind of to recognize the signs of covert attention, where someone may be pointing their head towards you, but there's a glazed look and their mind is far away. It looks like they're paying attention to you, but they're actually paying attention to the person sitting in the back of the room who's doing something they want to look at or, or know about. And then, I love this cow, this cow's face, it's just amazing. But you have mirror neutrons, and this is when it gets really important. Without this, children wouldn't learn from their parents. We wouldn't learn from each other. We learn by copying each other, by observing each other. And every society is different, every culture is different, so that's why we're not all the same in different parts of the world. We are learning from the people we are around. And that is just astounding that we're able to do that. That is our social intelligence. So joint attention is critical for language and cognitive and social development. We cannot just be alone.
we don't learn everything that way. When I first heard this about Chuck Close, if you saw his early work, his large black and white canvases, you see them from a distance, they look like the most clear, precise, exact photograph you've ever seen, and they're gigantic. And then I saw a special on him. Of course, he's wheelchair bound now. He has some very, very uh, debilitating physical situations. And you think, well, that would definitely stop him from doing good work or doing a lot of work, but it hasn't. It's done the opposite. He was born with something called face recognition blindness. That means you cannot store that information and process it and bring it back. So, as a child, he'd come to breakfast, his mother would be there, he didn't recognize her. He might have recognized the smell of breakfast, he might have recognized the dress she had on, if she wore it before. But her face did not make that connection. Can you imagine what that is like? So what did he do? He painted faces and people. He found a way to record language that he could understand. And then as he got more of a disability and could not even hold a brush, he made a system of painting in a grid that has revolutionized the way he's done portraits. And they're more beautiful, and they're more creative, and they're better in spite of what he's gone through, or maybe because of what he's gone through. So look at this. Here are two photos side by side. On the right, you have a system of neurons and the way they're connected in your brain. On the left, we're looking into the cosmos. Side by side, there's something very unique about them. Your brain builds entire objects, including an awareness of their color, size, distance, and relation to other objects. You also have short-term memory, and you have an ability to tune out if you don't want to pay attention or to remember something. And our brains are designed to be very flexible. We can pay attention to what we want to pay attention to. And this happens at both the sensory and the cognitive level. Interesting photo on the right. I'm amazed when I found that. <laughs> Your eyes cannot detect anything without some sort of change happening. If something is totally static, there's nothing for us to compare. There's nothing for us to see or to process. So our cognitive illusions involve higher level brain functions of attention and expectations. And that's how we start to reason things out. Dali did this by looking at a postcard of an African village, changing it, turning it upright, and allowing us to see the hidden face in it that he saw. So, this is called shape-selective neurons, because it's something we already understand. It's in, our, it's in our brains already. We just have to look at it and interpret it. We're not learning anything new. We're just applying our knowledge to it. And you always also have favorite shapes. Whether you're an artist or not, you have certain shapes that you relate to. So those are stored in there, too. And when this is turned on uh, 90 degrees... Most of us see the face easier than if it's horizontal. The reason is, we process people standing up most of the time. And so that's the way we record their faces and our understanding. Stare at this for about 15 seconds. Try not to move your eyes, just stare directly at this uh, flag design. There's something called illusionary after images. And this is something that helps our brain be more efficient. So when I change to the next slide, keep looking at the screen and see what you see. If you looked at that first image long enough, you're going to see a new image of a flag, but it's going to have the colors we're used to seeing. 
because that's what your brain told you to see. Here's a very simple way. I can do this with children and they get it, they understand it. Um, if you look at the red dot, again, for maybe 15, 20 seconds, and then focus on the white side, the dot will reappear. Not exactly the same, but it will reappear. It really isn't there. Your brain tells you it is. Well, Dali really understood these sorts of things. So this particular illustration comes from Destino, a film that he helped design in the Walt Disney Studios, although it wasn't produced for many years. It is now out and available. It's pretty amazing. If you concentrate on something, you are only going to do about 1-3% to 3 of your total vision. That's all you're going to use, that little pinpoint area. And then we can see something very clear, and we can process that. If you try to take in everything, it's too much. Plus, our peripheral vision is not as focused or clear. But it's kind of amazing, isn't it, that it's that small of an amount, less than 5%. That's called the macula. And in the center of the macula is the fovea. That means there's even a greater amount of high acuity vision. And now we're down to about 1%. Your peripheral vision has very low resolution. And that's used by artists in an amazing way. This painting, if you've ever seen it in person, is astounding. You understand why da Vinci carried it with him, no matter where he lived, and it was with him when he died. People say she's looking at you, even if you walk by her. Her smile moves, and yet it's a painting. It can't happen. So what's the illusion? How does it work? The way it works is if you concentrate on her mouth, it's pretty static. But if you look away from her mouth to her eyes, now the mouth is in your peripheral vision. And your peripheral vision actually pulls those shadows and makes it look like it has moved. Nothing really has moved, but your brain tells you it has. How he could do that and make it that effective when this painting was made is really astounding. So the peripheral area is where you see gross details, motion and shadows. So when you involve the peripheral area, motion comes out of the shadows. It's to such an extent that there's something called change blindness. Let's say you're focused, you're, you're going to a job interview and you're sitting in one of those chairs in this very stark office, a plant, a window, a coffee table, so forth. And you're reading your resume. You're concentrating on it because you want this to really go well. There's no one else in the room. This elephant could walk through that room. And if it didn't make a noise, or you couldn't smell it, you wouldn't know it was there. Because your one to three percent is so focused on that piece of paper in front of you, your peripheral doesn't tell you that that's happening. We do this every day in our offices, in our homes, in our cars. One reason we have auto accidents. We're not focused on what's in front of us or happening. And our peripheral can't do it. We have accidents. So change blindness is very, very interesting. The double image on the right piece, the slave market with a disappearing bust of Voltaire, uh, is Dolly's version of a double image done so beautifully that it actually has layers of understanding, not just one simple idea. And now, occlusion and perspective. These things are used so much by surrealists. Number one, occlusion is when you put one object in front of another. Now, the painting on the left by Magritte, obviously, that's just a flat canvas with paint. It's not a bird, it's not a man with a hat. We know that. But our brain doesn't tell us that. Our brain tells us that because the bird is covering his face, it's closer to us. 
because that's how we understand it. That's how we process this. Linear perspective is more like the painting on the right of Dali's. A remake of Persistence of Memory done in 52 to 54. And one point perspective is extremely important for this small painting to have an immense depth. This is something that Dali and others are very good at. So this depth, you can see, happens in many different ways. It happens in something that's directly linear. It can also happen in repeated shapes and shapes that become smaller. As they become smaller, we register that as further away. Girl with Curls is an unusual painting because it's number one based on atmospheric perspective, which is something that Dali didn't often do, Da Vinci did though. And then it, this figure is, seems to be out of place. It's either too large or there's something that just doesn't work here. Of course he did it intentionally. And this is size perspective. So he's really telling us that that village, that building, is extremely far away from this person, and that person's very close to us, even though it doesn't seem to balance. These two photos on the left are an exact, uh, an exact opposite of size perspective. Now we're doing tricks with a camera. Obviously, the people in the top that look like they're standing on his hand, or being blown off his hand, or in the background. Most of us take pictures like this or trick photography from time to time. The other thing, of course, is to create an object that is recognizable. We also have a recognizable size, like this eyeball, but it's made in a, in a different scale, either smaller or larger. This one, obviously, is larger, and our brain is now processing it differently because if we first looked at that eye, it assumed it was a human eye. And now it looks at the buildings and the trees. Oh my goodness, I've got to refigure this. Gestalt, really the first psychologist to codify this whole idea of good continuation. So things that aren't there, our brain tells us they are, or at least helps us understand. So the three uh, fluid graces on the left, parts of the figures are there. One of the figures is almost not there at all and yet we read that she is because the landscape allows us to connect this shape to that shape, this contour to that contour, and allows us to see the figure. A very famous illustration on the right is the cube that appears on a flat piece of paper. It's not there. There are black dots with some white areas uh, superimposed upon them. But our brain cannot do that. It can't just see the dots alone. It keeps trying to see that cube because we want to connect the dots. This kind of painting became so perfected that until photography came along, it really was a way to record the way we perceive a given scene. So artists also have their personal style or interpretation. But for a period of time, the better you could paint, realistically, the more famous you became. And then we enter an era where that wasn't the only way to paint. I'm not saying it doesn't exist now, it does, but it's a portion of what we do. It's not all of what we do. This has been going on since the 15th century. That's a long time. Here's Dali, 1926. He's only 22 years old, and he paints Basket of Bread, one of three paintings that came to the United States for the first time. This painting, more than the melting watches, is what opened doors in this country. And people realized, who is this kid, this young man from Spain, who paints like a master? And then can do other things too. It's pretty amazing. It is based on optics, it is based on science, but he's also melded religion. Amazing. Architects started to discover that they could use this. If they want an illusion of a larger space, 
instead of building the dome, they paint it. And when you see that photo on the left, it doesn't appear that it's flat. It appears that it has this wonderful dome with light shining through. The stairway on the bottom doesn't exist either. It's a chalk drawing on a sidewalk. It's really not there. So, in the 60s, some artists decided, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually just do the illusion. It's not going to be an illusion of anything else. You're not going to perceive something that isn't there. You're going to see what really is there. But I'm going to change it in a way that the illusion becomes the art. And it was called op art, optical art. So the illusion itself was the goal. This freed up all of us in saying that if you can do that, now we can use illusion any way we want. Not just to make something look realistic. Saccade is when your eyes move back and forth very, very rapidly. When you think you're fixating on something, you're looking at something closely, you think that your eyes are still. But they're not. If they were still, you wouldn't have anything to see. It's got to compare and contrast. It's so rapid, we don't know it. It's so small, we don't know it. But it happens. The detail we see is in a small circle at the center of your gaze, covering 1% of your retina. 1%. So we must have powerful brains that can take that amount of limited information and transform it into our understanding of the visual world. So without these microscopic eye movements, you would be blind when you fix your gaze. Gaze, you wouldn't see anything. Some stationary patterns actually generate in another illusion the perception of motion. If you stare at these, because of the contrast and the arrangement of the spaces and areas, you see movement. We all know it's not happening. Your left brain knows that, but your right brain says, oh, yes it is. But what's moving is your eyes. Your eyes are following it. Your eyes are moving, and it's making the piece look like it's moving. This is all about perception. That's what it is, all about perception. This is interesting. I, I have uh, daughters and granddaughter who have been in gymnastics and dance, and um, it's beautiful, and you watch the movement, it's, it's mesmerizing. And then I found out why. Because there is one time when we don't have to do that, and that's what, when we look at something with movement already, and it's called smooth pursuit. So you're tracking a moving object. So now your eyes are moving, but it's moving the direction they are. And here is one of Dali's masterpieces, one of his masterworks, the hallucinogenic Toreador. And think of what you have to do in this painting to really understand it. Our docents do a wonderful job of this, explaining to the public if they've never seen it before. But this painting requires, I'm going to read this, the viewer to focus on individual images. There are many, many images. 31 Venuses alone in there. Remember Dalinian symbols. So the gadflies, the bull, the things that he uses in his art. You have to remember those. And then Dali's history. Where he lived, who he met, what relationships he had, who influenced him, and so forth. And then you assemble all the elements as a whole, and you filter them through a lens of a specific cultural event in Spanish history, the goring of this bullfighter. That and more is in that one canvas. So to understand Dali, we need to really use our brains and all the things we've stored there. And the more we learn, it seems like the more we need to find out. That's why people come back and look at his work over and over again. They've already seen it, but they might not have understood it, and they might find something new every time they come back. 
Dali is not only stretching our visual perception, but also filtering multiple neurons in both hemispheres of our brain. That's a mark of great art. He truly challenges the viewer to participate in a holistic way. And that brings us to this. Remember I talked about Daniel Pink at the beginning of this lecture and talked about the way he really thought the future, especially for America, for creative problem solving is through the right side of your brain. So here's what he's done to explain it to us. He says we're in the agricultural age of farming in the 18th century. That was the primary way to make a living or just survive. Then in the 19th century, it became the industrial age where factory workers found another way to be paid for their work and take care of their needs. Then the 20th century, the century of Picasso, was the information age, where knowledge is something that you work with. Knowledge becomes a factor. And in the 21st century, he calls it the conceptual age, where creators and empathizers will be the driving force of this century. So, how do we relate this back to Dali or to brain research? It wasn't hard to do. It really was not hard to do because I went right down the line. Pink says we're not just function but design. His word. Not just argument but story. Not just focus but symphony. Not just logic, empathy. Not just seriousness, but play. And finally, not just accumulation, but meaning. So let's take a moment and look at these and see how it relates to us through the eyes of Signor Dali. Here's our portfolio. We're looking at design first. Choose things in your life that will endure, that are a pleasure to use. Never let things be more important than your family, friends, and your own spirit. He was true to his own spirit. Story. We are our stories. They provide context enriched by emotion, a deeper understanding of how we fit in and why it even matters. We are each the authors of our own lives. That's beautifully put. Symphony. I am the best at what I can't do. I love this. Feel free to move, listen to your heart, learn, act, and even if it means that you will make mistakes, it's okay. If you want a creative life, do what you can't and experience the beauty of the mistakes you make. You learn from those mistakes. You evolve through those mistakes. It's okay to embrace them as long as you don't make them too often. Empathy. Empathy is neither a deviation from intelligence nor the single route to it. Sometimes we need detachment. Many other times we need attunement. We need androgynous minds able to toggle between them both. It's a healthier feeling if you can do that. Play. The opposite of play is not work. It's depression. To play is to act out and be willful, exultant, committed as if you are assured of your prospects. Children know how to play. Picasso tells us we need to learn to be more like a child. And this aspect it would make us healthier and happier. Meaning. And this is a wonderful place to conclude. You will only find meaning by giving meaning to life from inside yourself, every individual. We are not human beings on a spiritual path, but spiritual beings on a human path. 
Thank you for listening. And uh, I hope you appreciate the wonderful ideas that came through these resources and through this discussion.